Take it away, David and Ken. We've got a beautiful spotlight show for you today. They're here to share all about non-dual teachings and they're already giggling. So it's going to be great. <laughs> that was it. It was over. <laughs> great, wasn't it? They didn't know how first. <laughs> you missed it. It was amazing. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. <laughs> we're on. Yeah, we're on. I know. We're ready. <laughs> <laughs> we just disappeared for a moment yes, yes. into complete non-duality. Yeah. So just so blessed to have David here with us today. That's great to be here. We've yes. had a lot of joy here in the studio and everywhere. <laughs> yeah, and this wonderful topic of um, non-duality. It was something in my heart that I wanted to share. Um, and it came very clear to me like, oh, yeah, I'd really love to sit with David on this. And I didn't think it would happen. And bingo, here we are. <laughs> yeah, you sent me an email and yep. here we are in the chairs ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> we made it. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, we had a wonderful lunch um, together just sharing. And it was just so funny just sharing our joy about the Course in Miracles and what it meant to us. And one of the things that um, stood out for me in that conversation is when we were talking about um, spirituality and I was saying I'd gone around and I've been exploring all these other things and Zen, non-dual paths, um, Krishna, all the things. And then I thought, wow, there's so many amazing things here but I just want one book that's got everything in it. Mm -hmm. And then bingo, in came The Course in Miracles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you said, oh, yeah, I must have had that prayer somewhere in my yeah. heart. Yeah. Because there's just so many avenues that you can go down. Mm -hmm. But yet, The Course in Miracles has everything in it for us. Yeah. And so something that was really coming like strong to me was like, um, Jesus really has like, been like an important part of this for me. It seems like I've built up this relationship and trust with Jesus. And I know that that was something that happened with you. Like all of a sudden, this voice you started hearing, something that you realized wasn't of you, this eternal, um, internal teacher. Could you tell us a little bit about like what that is and what that is for you now? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I would say it's a direct connection and that's probably what I was praying for. Mm. And another way to say it is, I wish this could be faster. I wish this could be more direct. I wish this there would be a way of saving time and not, you know, kind of the old leave no stone unturned because mm. there seems to be a lot of stones. <laughs> yeah. You know, whether you talk about it spiritually as a metaphor or just mm. in the world. It's like trying to pick up every grain of sand off the, the beaches with a, with a tweezer. <laughs> Sometimes that's the way the spiritual journey can seem. So... Anything that saves time is more direct. So it was the course came before I had that direct contact of this mm. voice speaking to me. It took a couple, two or three years before mm. the the channel was open and it mm. became clear and direct. And then that was seemed to be the whole point of the course uh, was just accomplished in that mm. making contact because then it was a direct sense there still seemed to be a David asking questions <laughs> and a Jesus answering at that point and there mm. still seemed to be uh, two distinct you know one who's needing help and one who's <laughs> offering help and one who is there to receive uh, listen and follow the instructions and one who's giving the instructions mm. and then of course as you go deeper that's just a metaphor too that, that there's going to be a merge a unification which is the whole point, yeah. the, the whole goal. So it was very profound for me. Mm. And I can tell, you know, just even you sharing in the previous mm. show, you know, you ask the question and then the answer is given. And then oftentimes there was a, and why is this? And, yeah. you know, I was doing the same yeah. thing back and forth, like a dialogue. Mm. And uh, that's the value of, of the direct connection. And um, that's not to be, defined in terms of words mm. you know saying that this connection is is dualistic or non-dualistic mm. or putting words onto it it's it's a, an experience mm. and it's an experience of of help uh, of being shown in a very practical way and and instructions given which are extremely helpful mm. when you believe in 
a world of duality, then you need to have an answer that's practical. And it's not just this voice from the sky, I am the Lord God, or oneness is all there is, love is all there is. You know, it's, it's actually very practical, like this is the answer to your specific question. And eventually it gets quieter and quieter because the specific questions start to fade away mm. and fall away. And hallelujah for that. Yeah, absolutely. And so like, it's like, for me, it's like, it's, it felt so nurturing to realize that there was someone truly there that was helping me totally and utterly unconditionally. Um, and as you said, it's like an experience. You can't really describe it to anybody. And it's like people say, but how do you know? And you say, well, I, I just know. You just feel something very different about yourself that like, okay, this is true. This is absolutely the truth. But yet to really try and convey that is so, so hard to do. But yet the joy starts to come through in that and the love and the, because for me it's felt like so being so fearful, but yet this voice was like, don't worry, it's okay. I've really, really got you. Mm. And it feels extremely safe. And so that's mm. like the first step to be, okay, he has really, really got my back. Yeah. Yeah, that direct contact is, it's not what we would consider interpersonal uh, because interpersonal is at the realm of persons. And this is like a direct contact within, mm. almost like if you're having a direct hotline <laughs> to spirit and uh, you don't have to run it through a switchboard of persons. Mm. You don't have to kind of let the committee meet and say, what do you think? <laughs> okay, five to four, if we like the answer. You know, there's no, yeah. there's nothing political about this direct connection. It's, it's, it's not personal and it's mm. not really interpersonal. And it's like revelation. It's, mm. it's, uh, it's highly intimate, but it's not can't even be shared mm. between persons. So it's like a, a glimpse of direct knowing, mm. and those revelations seem to be rare. But but uh, miracles are more of an interpersonal quality because there's a sense of connection, and there's a sense of uh, communication that can be sung or shared with words and hugs and mm. laughter and sparkly twinkly eyes <laughs> and all these kind of things that we're pretty accustomed to in our community and with a lot of the people that I meet all over the world. And those are important too. Mm. You know, those people may say, those sounds like crumbs. And from a higher perspective, you know, <laughs> the light is everything. Yeah. So they are in that sense crumbs, but mm. the crumbs are important mm. when you believe in duality because the crumbs help loosen that belief in duality. Mm. And they're part of the spirit, the oneness using what the ego made to point the mind back to an experience of that oneness. Mm. As, as you're talking, I'm thinking almost like a puzzle. Like I believe that I was fragmented and there seems to be these pieces of the puzzle that are coming together. Mm. They're not a personal, they're nothing personal, but yet they're coming in. And that voice has always been there telling me the truth. It's not even like me. I've never really existed the seeming Kenneth character. But yet this stream has always been there as a truth. Is, is that what you're saying? Well, a stream is like when you have faith and you're open to guidance, the stream is like the guidance. Mm. The actual state of God is, is a state of eternity. It's a state of absolute pure oneness, unconditional love. And... The, that state of mind, we could call it abstract reality or abstract mm. oneness, it, it, it's all that there is. Yeah. So there's a part in the workbook where Jesus says, we say God is, and then we cease to speak. Oh, yes. So cease to speak, mm. that's referring to silence. Yeah. So it's almost like you can imagine that's just a way of the stream saying, well, there are two words actually that we we say, and then we dive into this deep mm. silence where there really is no we. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's just, it's just isness. It's yeah. just love. It's just light, joy, happiness. And mm. that's the state of reality. So the course it says in the introduction can be summed up very simply. Nothing real can be threatened. So the oneness, the love, the joy, the happiness, the eternal nature of God and God's love Heaven cannot be threatened. Mm. Nothing unreal exists. Mm. Words don't exist. Mm. Time doesn't exist. Space doesn't exist. 
perception doesn't exist. It's kind of imagine waking up yeah. every day and just having, you know, we have Jesus come <laughs> through our mind, but just that line, the perception doesn't exist. Perception. So maybe we need to just, people can say, what, perception? What, what is that? Um, even consciousness, you know, that word gets used a lot. It gets lumped in with mm-hmm. Christ consciousness, God consciousness. You know, you re- read all the spiritualities and yeah. in the Course, Jesus says, consciousness is the domain of the ego. Ooh. Yeah. Consciousness was the first split. Ooh. That if it was the first split and it's the domain of the ego, then it's the, that means that even God consciousness or Christ consciousness, those are oxymorons. Yeah. Ooh, this is ooh, this is going deep. And then perception. If we say consciousness is, it has levels. Remember the '60s. Raise your consciousness. Train your consciousness. Absolute oneness doesn't have to be raised anywhere. God doesn't isn't raised or lowered. Uh, God, love, eternal oneness isn't. It doesn't have levels. And and then that's where people say, well, I get confused then with the levels of the Trinity, mm-hmm. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And and again, the only way you can be confused is to not have a direct contact with that, because yeah. it's actually just one spirit, and it's just being used in metaphors to help you reach that one mm-hmm. spirit. It's not. It's actually not a triune God. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a, that's a theology again. People mm-hmm. would say that sounds kind of Christian. <laughs> You know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that's a theology. Mm. All perception doesn't exist. All theology doesn't exist. Mm. And just mm. see like a theologian rolling, <laughs> oh, thanks. That's, you just told me my whole profession yeah. doesn't exist. That's right. And the person who believes he's a the- theologian doesn't exist either. Perception is the realm of specifics. So whereas we say abstract reality, love doesn't have any specifics. Joy doesn't have any specifics. Heaven doesn't have specifics. So everything within time and space is specifics. Even if we talk about a black hole, that's a specific. Or a galaxy, that's a specific. Or the cosmos and all the parts. Like, for example, when they say cosmos, they'll sometimes say time, space, cosmos. Uh Uh-huh. Time, space, cosmos. Unreal, unreal, unreal. Even if you bring in some of the great thinkers of the world, like quantum physicists, or let's roll back to somebody, a scientist that people are familiar with, Einstein. So Einstein, he had this idea that time was not an absolute. And a lot of the scientists of his day, or his era, thought, he's got that one wrong. You know, time is an absolute. One second is one second. No matter where you go in the United States or in the world, one second is still one second. Now in quantum physicists, they've done tests and experiments, Michael Green and different ones, Brian Green with the, the seeing that, that no, one second isn't one second, that the time and space and gravity and all these other factors and black holes, uh, they it's all relative. So... One second is not one second anywhere in the cosmos. It's, it's different. It has different qualities. And, and so does space. Space can be bent. <laughs> People are like, what? <laughs> but, but if you start to go bigger into the cosmos, you can start to realize that the things that humans may consider as constants, as absolutes, aren't that way at all if you get into a big enough context. So Jesus is basically saying anything that is specific is in the realm of perception. And when we talk about duality, that is where, that's a synonym there. Perception is dualistic. Mm-hmm. It doesn't exist, but it, you, everything about it is, is a world of opposites. And how did that even happen? Where did this world of opposites mm-hmm. come from if God didn't create it? It's a projection of a split mind. Mm-hmm. And so the split, instead of being in the mind, the split mind, it's seen, it's projected to a world of fast and, and slow, hot and cold, male, female, and all the time and space. You know, you can see the whole cosmos is just a projection of a split mind. So then we have to start to say, but isn't a split mind even dualistic? Yes, it is. 
it's dualistic as well. It's not reality. It wasn't created by God. It's not heaven. It's not, <laughs> it's not joy and happiness. And so everything of perception involves dualism. And that's why there's so much to debate <laughs> even among the illusory little people and the illusory theologians mm. there's a huge debate about dualism and non-dualism mm. and just like there are debates in <laughs> philosophy about free will versus determinism because nobody knows anything in the realm of perception mm. because there are it literally can't be known it's not created by god it's a total complete illusion and then there can be there can be no understanding with perception either. That means the most honest sta statement that you could ever make in relation to perception is, I know nothing. That's the most honest <laughs> statement. When you start out with, at least I know this much, oh no. There's that, you can't say that in the realm of perception. So it's good to have kind of that context mm -hmm. for it. And, and if people say, well, wait a minute, if everything, perception's all unreal and it's all specifics, then, then what, what else could we call this name, God or oneness or wholeness or, or completion, nirvana? Uh, a word that Jesus uses is content. Love is content and not form of any kind. So we know there's a lot of spiritualities, there's a lot of religions that talk about, you know, being a saint or being, uh, this person was the pure radiant presence of love, but persons don't exist. How can a person be the pure <laughs> radiant presence of love when God is not a respecter of persons? As the Bible says that there, God didn't even create persons. How can you have a, a spiritual person or an enlightened being or an avatar when God didn't create avatars. He didn't, God didn't create uh, spiritual beings. And, and there's no specifics. God doesn't even know specifics. So form is where perception is. And content is what love is. Mm -hmm. Love is content and not form of any kind. Mm -hmm. There's a great line in the Beyond All Idols section where Jesus comes out with one of the shortest sentences in the course, but it's, a, it's packed. <laughs> Four words in one sentence. God knows not form. Ooh, <laughs> he tucked it in there. You have to go find that one in the Beyond the Idol section. God knows not form. And yet you have a lot of religions, a lot of spiritualities that will say that it's possible for you as a person to become the living embodiment you have to embody love. You have to embody Christ. You have, and this I hear in so many spiritualities, embody, body. Wait a minute. God knows, not form. And now I'm supposed to embody divine love. So let's use another word. Jesus would say that to teach is to demonstrate. So imagine that you just gave yourself so fully over to this purpose. This, this happiness, this joy, you so much said, God, let me know that, that everything is you. I give all the glory to you. You are everything. And, and if I give myself over to that, you might say a stepping stone in perception would be to be a demonstration, a reflection of God's love. It's not ultimately where it all ends because a reflection or a demonstration or even a symbol is still implying two as if there's this vastness and then there's this <laughs> reflection of the vastness mm -hmm. like the sun or the light and then there's this reflection in the end everything's about the merge everything is to yesterday's lesson was i will accept the atonement for myself is that's just accepting yourself as as the christ as one with god and that's a merge. That isn't a sense of, oh, I'm going to know myself and I'll still be me and God will still be God and we'll both coexist. Both. Both. There is no both in, in oneness. It's all just abstract, absolute oneness. So that's important when we start to talk about non-duality is because when you have a teaching 
or a theology that says you need to become the embodiment. You really have to look closely at what that even means. And you and I know we enjoy working with a teaching that says, I am not a body. I am free. I am still as God created me. You know, it will come in with that in many ways. And, and yet, what we've come to appreciate with the Course is that it is still practical. It's written as if the separation occurred, it's, which it didn't. But it's written as if it did. It's written as if there, are, there is somebody, some person to read words. Because actually, if we really step back from what I was just talking about, <laughs> words are dualistic. <laughs> And, and people would say, oh, if words are dualistic, are you telling me that the word God is dualistic? Yeah, well, even that word, God doesn't even know word. God didn't create words. The ego invented all the words. <laughs> so everybody, I mean, when I was in Christianity, people were always saying, don't blasphemy. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Well, the, actually, the Lord doesn't have a name. But see how deep that is? That's too too far. <laughs> that gets you knocked off the air when you say the Lord doesn't have a name. But you start to get to a point where, where the Spirit knows that if you believe you've separated from God, you believe in words. So the Spirit's going to use the words to take the mind into an experience that's wordless. Doesn't that make sense? Yeah. So the Spirit will use what the ego made to take the mind into an experience that there's no ego, and there's no world, there's only love, there's only God, there's only happiness, there's only oneness, there's only heaven. And so this is why the Course is kind of written in a symphonic way. It's not some kind of scientific paper where you're supposed to be able to go and every word has to fit with every other word. When I worked with a group of students back in the 1990s, one of the biggest complaints, I remember one student, one came one time and she said, this book, she had the course in her hand, this book is totally inconsistent. And she said, I'll show you, I'll prove it to you. He says this, and then he says this, and look what he says over here. He is not consistent. How can I trust someone who's so inconsistent? And then I said, well, look at this passage, that the course is only consistent in its goal, in its aim. Basically, it's saying it's only consistent in what it's pointing towards, which is truth. That there's never going to be anything consistent in perception because it was made up by the ego as a veil to cover over truth. And you will not find consistency in error. You will not find consistency in specifics. You will never find it in perception. You can still say that, that the Spirit will use that. In other words... You know, somebody one time asked me, well, how, how do I find a true teacher or how do I gravitate? How do I know to trust a teacher or a confidant or a mentor or a guru? And I said, well, if you can kind of be around them and if you're around them and they are pretty much consistently happy and peaceful and joyful, that's a, a good kind of barometer to, to move toward it, but, but of course you're going to have to discover this for yourself. But Jesus can't take away the sins. He can't take away the guilt. He has already done it, and he can be a demonstration or a role model, we'll say, of, of a mind that's freed of slavery, freed of guilt, freed of fear. And he can be a demonstration, but still he cannot intervene in our mind. He can't jump into our mind and say, let me just intervene between your thoughts and the effects of your thoughts. If you want to hold on to grievances and attack thoughts, he can show you the conditions of that, like it's producing fear, it's something you don't really want. But like you said in your show this morning, he can, he can say, this is what you're doing. I would not advise that you continue this if you want to be peaceful and happy. But he's not coming in to, like your show's name is Divine Intervention. He's more of a... a a cheerleader, a, a guide, a demonstration, and a great helper. But if, if you don't want to know the truth, if you don't want the experience of who you are, that's where it seems that spirit is patient, even though spirit is really timeless. And if 
you're timeless, you can't be patient. But, but you know, from that sense, it, he's like, I will wait as long as it takes because, as you said in the show, I'm always here. This morning you were saying, I'm here, I'm still here. <laughs> you feel yourself, I'm still here. <laughs> and so this is really deep because what we're talking about here, it starts to really whittle things down and it starts to take it beyond the realm of belief to there is an actuality called truth, we'll say, just to be simple. Mm -hmm. And truth cannot be described or explained, only experienced. So if we just look at that, truth cannot be described or explained, but only experienced. It means that theology isn't going to reach truth. All theology, which is all concepts, you know, and by various names on earth. Theology is words and concepts. It's the most that these words and concepts can be is like a trampoline. And so Jesus wants to get you, come on over to this trampoline and let's start jumping. And then you're on the trampoline and he's on the gym and then you're jumping. And before you know, boom, <laughs> you're gone. A trampoline's gone. What happened? You know, but that's what he's trying to do. He's just trying to say, come to my trampoline and bounce with me. Let's bounce together, mm. connect. Mm. And then as you start bouncing, all these old theological questions and ideas and how could the separation happen, you know, mm. you're, you're just bouncing and your joy, glee, and you're having more fun and pretty mm. soon the trampoline's gone and you, you don't know what happened. It's just, you can't, it, it was never there. It was almost like it was just a device that he used. So it's fun to think of it that way. It's very playful. Instead of sitting, thinking of these theologians or philosophers, very serious things. Well, you, what you think could be, what I don't know, you know, the beard. And I, I think about what if you consider this, you know, it's almost like let's debate our way back to God. But debating is in the realm of perception. And the Holy Spirit is the one, and Jesus, who have transcended it, they're the ones that are guiding and instructing to say, let's, you have to go higher. You have to get, you have to actually forget perception at, at some point because it never was created by God. It does, it's a hallucination to use a psychological term. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, I was just thinking about, because um, each time we use words, as you said, it's always we're in the duality of it. It's always the, and at the end of the course, he says, now we're almost ready to let go of all of the words. Yes. It's like, oh, well, what does that mean? You know, it can be fearful to the ego because I think I am these um, thoughts. Um, but I was thinking about, okay, so how, how, how do I bridge that gap from seemingly there's this duality, there's me and you and we're talking, and how do I get to that non-duality? How do I get to bounce with Jesus? What, 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 is, he, what is he helping me with? in that what's well, the steps i think you know how like when when you have small children you know the thing i love about little children is they're a symbol of curiosity i love the curiosity of little children because they don't have this kind of arrogant i know mind they ask questions they honestly <laughs> ask questions what's that what's that i always tell the story when i went into a movie theater one time and I was down in the front and then this mother brought her small child into the movie theater and then they sat right near me in a row. But as the movie went on, the little child was like, what, mommy, what's that? What's that? What's that for two hours? What's that? What's that? And I think some of the people in the back of the theater were so frustrated that they, some of them even walked out. I was so delighted. I didn't even care to watch the movie. I was so delighted by the curiosity of the child that I was just in wonder for two hours mm -hmm. at the joy of openness to ask questions mm -hmm. without thinking, I already know. You see, when with adults, that's the problem. That's what makes spirituality so difficult is the I know mind is so crusted. They already think they've got something figured out, survival, or we talked, you talked about planning for the future mm -hmm. and past learning. And it's a pretty heavy veil over the innocence of I know nothing. So I would say if you have curiosity and then if you have a, a real sincere desire to know the truth, you know, that seek and you shall find, Jesus said in the Bible, knock and the door shall be open. So if you're seeking with sincerity, with desire, with openness, you have an open curiosity, then 
that kind of ignites the connection with spirit and you go faster and faster. Mm. And then also I would say it's since it doesn't have anything to do with theology, it doesn't really have anything to do with what we would call religions or spiritual pathways. You know, it's easy to get lost in the the beliefs because mm. there's a lot of beliefs that go into theology and spiritual pathways. But if we if we go scientific, let's shift mm -hmm. way over from the Christian and the biblical terms to scientific, that, that a scientist is curious. And then we know from, you know, Newtonian science that it was based on empiricism and measuring the world. We now know from quantum physics that it's not based on empiricism. It's, it's, it's based on you go smaller and smaller mm -hmm. into the subatomic particles and you go down, 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 and boom, mm -hmm. the quantum field is there. Mm -hmm. Well, the quantum field would be that that reflection, the quantum field is not God. Sometimes, you know, people think, the scientists may go, oh my God, I found God. It's like, well, it's pretty close. <laughs> but even the quantum field will disappear because abstraction, light, pure light, doesn't have any particles. There are no subatomic particles with it. And it's totally connected. That's what's so reflective of God is that the quantum field is, absolutely connected it's called um, entanglement but it's absolutely connected but that's still not it either that's just a gateway into it but for those that have discovered the quantum field that took a lot of curiosity for those scientists to actually discover that you know the, the newtonian uh, scientists weren't looking for it they were looking for the answers in the perception but now the quantum scientists, you see, by the, just their curiosity, they kept going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into what they call the wacky world of quantum particles and quantum physics because they, they knew less and less and less the more they came to the quantum field. Because the quantum field contradicts everything of, of perception. You might say it's, it's like the symbol of the Holy Spirit, that connectivity that energy that's underneath um, all the seeming separate forms and fragments. So in answer to your question, if you have that curiosity and you have a desire to know the truth, or as the Greeks said, know thyself, mm. that's really what drives the whole thing. That's what activates everything. Mm. You don't even have to worry about how, because if you have that desire to know the truth or know who you are, everything that you yeah. seem to need or everything of perception will be used in a way, orchestrated in a way to, to take you on that springboard mm. and literally spring beyond time and space. Yeah, show me the truth and everything will be added yeah. unto me. Yes, totally revealed. Yeah. Everything will be revealed. Yeah, just put that truth first. I think there's a line mm -hmm. in the course he says that. Just, yeah. just ask for the truth yeah. and you will find it. Yeah. It's very that simple. And as you said, that's what I love about children too. When you see them, they're just so open in the room. You, you yeah. feel them. Wow, yeah. what's happening? Yeah, yeah. It's just everything just feels totally yeah. and utterly amazing. Yes. And then seemingly we become closed down thinking that you actually know something. Yeah. And that's like the reversal. We're now reversing all of those ideas that we thought. And we have the symbol of Jesus to ask, okay, show me what the truth is in all of this because I don't know. I don't know what my best yeah. interests are anymore. So please continuously show me more and more and more. Yeah. And I think that's something that you always shared. You always questioned everything and your friends were like, Ross, could you just stop questioning yeah. everything? But you were like, yeah. no, I really, really want to know. And that's the only way we ever find yeah. out anything. Eventually you will, you, you, will, you will get there. Yeah. So I was just thinking, how does forgiveness come into all of this? Well, if you think of absolute love and oneness as all that is nothing real can be threatened nothing unreal exists forgiveness is is relating to that second part um nothing unreal exists and so when the mind believes that something not of god can actually exist when the mind believes that separation from god is actually possible when the mind believes that there is such a thing as an error Oneness doesn't know of errors. 
Oneness doesn't know of separation. God doesn't even know about the world or the cosmos, much less creating it. God doesn't even know about it. Then forgiveness comes in as, as the correction of error. And this is where we have the Holy Spirit uh, as a symbol, like a bridge. Like if there's just absolute love and oneness, and here's the belief in separation, how do you make the bridge back from separation to oneness? And so that's what forgiveness is. But you don't forgive your brother, your sister for what they did. You actually have to go much deeper to forgive them, as he says, for what they did not do. That's something I was never taught. I could just imagine <laughs> sitting in my little Protestant Christian church and the minister up behind the pulpit. Turn to your brother and sister that you are having trouble and difficulty with today. You feel anger and resentment and forgive them for what they did not do. What they what? What they did not do. What? But again, nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. You start to see that maybe I'm believing that they did something. Maybe I'm believing in the doer. Maybe I'm believing in bodies and persons. And I have labeled one of these bodies <laughs> as bad or labeled one of these behaviors that this body has done as, as evil. But, but that's a judgment too. That doesn't fit with eternal reality. So in one sense, it's, it's the releasing or the giving up of the beliefs in these errors. In the end, all things work together for good. There is a way of looking at the world with the Holy Spirit where you don't judge it. There's no judgment involved. I remember when I was reading the course and I was reading all the stuff, God did not create the body, God did not create the world, and, and uh, on and on. God did not create time and space. Am I getting this right? This is not in Genesis. It did not say this in Genesis. This is contradicting the core, my core Christian beliefs from the Bible in Genesis. And I'm like, is this just right? And I get to the workbook. The world was made as an attack upon God, a place where God could enter not. Okay, got it. That's clear. <laughs> That's clear. <laughs> that one I really never heard. I've never read that in Advaita Vedanta. I've never read that in any of the ancient Chinese teachings, the ancient Indian teachings. God didn't. The world was made as an attack upon God, a place where God could enter not. So that was a pretty strong language to say, I'm just trying to make it clear here. I said to you at the beginning that the course could be summarized. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. And he's kind of emphasizing the second part. Because really he's saying all, all, God is all there is, love is all there is, but he's like trying to make a point. Don't try to mix these two. Don't try to bring the truth into the illusion. Don't try to bring the light into the darkness. One is real, one isn't. That's what we call it, non-duality. And don't try to put a theology together that includes both truth and illusion. Because truth is true and only truth is true. I remember the first time I read that in the workbook. I read, truth is true and only the truth is true. I said, do you think I'm an imbecile? I mean, do you really think I cannot, I'm not paying attention that you have to put that second line in there? And then he comes in, oh, you may believe the first part, but you exclude the second part. Got me. Okay, you know, he says truth is true and only truth is true for a reason because that's what non-duality is. Love is true and only love is true. Spirit is true and only spirit is true. Oneness is true and only oneness is true. And all these debates about everything, much ado about nothing, Shakespeare called it, you know, is because why debate the impossible? when there is an experience that is real and true. So once we even talk about spiritual community, that's just, again, we talk about community, but that's just a symbol or a metaphor or a reflection. If, if you seem to have a happy, joyful experience, that's a good sign because that means you're moving towards a direct experience of, of love.
Mm-hmm. You're experiencing yourself as love, as loving. And as you shared on the show, just feeling worthy of that is like is really where the struggle, the forgiveness lessons seem to come in. Am I worthy of love? And during your show and, and some of these, shows, you know, I know there were a lot of tears because it's so, you were like really touching on when you said, I have, a, I have a control issue. And then you went to Jesus with it. And then, you know, we were, I was looking at the screen and there was tears and crying because you touched on something that's very raw. It's, it's a core, it's the core thing right there. Am I worthy of love? So the forgiveness is really coming to a purification and an actual direct experience. We're not really interested in changing the world. We're not interested in forming a community of bodies or a community of persons or growing a community even, you know. There, those would be goals of perception. And the goal that we have in our heart is not something that's in perception. We're not looking for an outcome. We're not looking for a more or some kind of a, a different reconfiguration. You know, like uh, when all the bombs stop and all the the guns are gone. And, you know, we're not looking for any of that. We're not looking for a political solution. We're not looking for a form-specific outcome solution. We're looking for an experiential solution to the problem of identity, of forgetting that I'm a perfect child of God. If there's a part in the Course where it says God has but one son, you know, even course teachers argue about that. They say, no, no. It says many things. Teachers of God, training teachers of God, and oh, there's plenty in there about training and, and going out and, and trying to reach perfection. But there's many teachers. And he does say in there, God has but one son. There's another part in the manual for teachers where he, the question is posed to Jesus, how many teachers of God does it take to save the world? And his answer one. is one. But then he qualifies the one. He says, but that one is not a body or in a body. You see how he, he's saying, remember, non-dualistic. I can easily lift it up. I can talk about training your mind. And it may take a long, long time. This, you know, as stages of development of trust. When you reach number five, you think, I am up to five. And all I've got is one more to go. And he says, it may take a long, long time, he puts in there. And then you think, well, time's an illusion though, right? So he's got things in there like the holy instant. He's, he's calling us into the holy instant. He's saying the holy instant is so practical because if you can just go into the holy instant, that's like the trampoline. Everything is solved in the holy instant. And all belief in time or long, long time and, and practice and repeat, repeat, repeat and all that stuff, that's all part of the Holy Spirit using the metaphor of just saying, come to the trampoline. All that mind training and time and space and everything is come to the trampoline. And the Holy Instant is like, is, is like leaping with Jesus into eternity because there's only one Son of God, and, and that means there's, it's accomplished. It, this whole salvation, redemption thing is already accomplished. It's not a future thing. It's like, come to the trampoline with me now and jump now. Leap. Leap with me now. So I would say, because we call ourselves kind of a mystical community, that we've been seemingly done travels and teachings and singing and we do TV shows and all kinds of exp- expressions. Still much to do about nothing. But we're blowing. We're making a happy no- noise unto the Lord, as the Bible says. This is a happy noise unto the Lord. And it looks like it's many forms. But actually, it's still all reflections of, oh, I want the holy instant. I, I want to desire the holy instant above everything else. Because if I desire the holy instant, I will let go of the past and I will let go of the future there's only now is the gateway to eternity. So that's what this is really about for us. We're just frolicking together. We're playing together. We're laughing together. And we have our, our focus on the holy instant. We're not, that's not going to be something that's going to have an intellectual understanding. There is no intellectual understanding because the intellect is part of perception. And understanding is in line with 
grace and love and light and eternity. That's you understand everything when you're in the, when you're the light. And perception, there is no understanding. So you just dance, frolic, make happy noises, and more and more. I don't understand the thing that's happening here. I do not understand what I'm doing, where I'm going, how to look upon the world or upon myself. You're more oh. Oh, more disoriented, more bouncing on the trampoline with Jesus, <laughs> higher and higher, happier and happier, knowing less and less and less about everything, and then it's it's over. <laughs> it never happened. You know, you actually have you just have an experience of I amness. Yeah. That's really what what it's all about. Yeah, so like what you're talking about is all of this like letting go. We're just letting go of absolutely everything, all these ideas. And um, like through Jesus, like that's what I loved about the Course in Miracles, as you said, because he just gives it, gives it to us straight. I know that's something that you wanted. Just tell me straight. Yeah, there's no world. Yeah. There is no world. You don't have to worry about it. It's not affecting you. It's not doing anything to you. Okay, great. How do we do that? How do we come over all this? It's all nonsense. So we want to get over it. And that's what you're saying is, yeah, we, we've just got to keep bouncing um, mm -hmm. in that space and really find that joy um, with him. And it's um, all over. But we have to know that this isn't actually real. We're not even having this conversation. But yet that has to be um, an experience um, to come into. Yeah. And I was just thinking about the times when something's like shifting my mind and I've just sat there and there was this one time I was just like laughing I couldn't believe how funny the whole thing seemed that I really thought it was so real. It was just so much like laughter. And then afterwards I sort of like come back and I, I, I saw like, it's just an absolute joke that I believe on this and there's something outside of me. And I know you've had these um, experiences and I'm just wondering what it's like for you now. It's like this just being in, in this sort of joy that just comes over you. Like even just like being here now, what, what's, what's this like? in this dialogue. Yeah. Well, it, it reminded me of, I think yesterday I was having uh, a, a meal with Lewis, who was just, he's gone back now down to Brazil, but he was talking about the, the lesson of the day and the reading from the text, and we was talking about faith and faithlessness, and he was just crying mm -hmm. through that section. Because to me, um, faith, just like trust would settle every problem now, and and faith and trust are, are the same in that sense. That there's all it does is is just looks upon um, the falsity or looks upon the error and and sees it's not real. That's really what forgiveness is. It just sees the false as false. It's not like you have to even point anything out. It's just this soft, quiet, observant presence. Uh, that's what forgiveness is. So it it looks upon illusions and just sees them for what they are. Uh, what's that song, Strawberry Field Forever, that the Beatles oh, yeah. did? There's nothing to get hung about. Um, that's that's the I love that. That's the line that's in there. That's the forgiveness line for me. There's nothing to get hung about. There's nothing to get hung up about. There's nothing to make a big deal about. When you just see the false as false, you see all perception as false. And therefore, you're joyful, and you're happy, and you're free. Mm. And that is, we could say, it's the happy dream or it's the forgiven world. That's mm. what there's nothing to get hung up about is all about. Mm. And I was remember I was reading the Course one time, and I was just getting clear about, okay, <laughs> the world's not real. God's real. Okay, this, this goes against Genesis, but you know, I guess. It was such old training, you know, about the God creating the world in seven stays and then resting you know, all this old story so i'm okay god is real world's not and then that, that was okay the ego made the world then i was reading the, the course and it said the maker of of another world and it had maker capitalized and i, I said it can't be the ego he never capitalizes mm -hmm. anything in the course so i stopped for a minute and i had asked jesus who is the maker of this other world and it was the Holy Spirit. So God is pure abstract love and light, but the maker of the real world, the world of no judgment, is the Holy Spirit. That's why we're called to join with the Holy Spirit, join with Jesus, because you can't really 
a person is impossible of seeing the truth from the false because the person is a construct that is false. Mm. So you can't have a false construct <laughs> that can tell the difference between the truth and illusion. You see, it's the Holy Spirit is the bridge. Mm. So that helped me realize that, wow, other parts of the Course where it's, he would say things like, like, God loves the world. And, and I would say, wait a minute, now you just convinced me just convinced me that God didn't create the world. You even said the world was made as an attack upon God, and then you say God loves the world. How can God love the world if, he, if it doesn't exist? It was like the Holy Spirit. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. What Turning what the ego made into this blessing of like a blanket of white peace glazing over the whole cosmos. It, that's something that a lot of, we'll say, non-dualistic traditions, whether it's ancient China and ancient India, they don't really talk about the Holy Spirit. They don't talk about guidance. Uh, that's where we started this conversation where, hallelujah, the Course is like, show it to me all in one place. And the Course, even though it says it's just one form of the universal curriculum and there are many other, it does also say, I found it in there, that this Course has everything that you need. Well, I could feel that. I was like, oh, this is like a complete package. It's still, people argue too whether the course is like, is it dualistic or is it non-dualistic? Well, it says at the back of the book that it says that this course is in the domain of the ego where it is needed. Okay, the course is part of the perceptual world. It's a book with words. But it's, it's come through in a way like it's discovering the, the trampoline. Mm. The book and the reading of it and the practicing of it and everything just leads you to a direct contact with your internal teacher, the Holy Spirit or Jesus. And that was the whole point. Yeah. Once contact is made, <laughs> <laughs> the book can fly. You know, you don't, you don't need to just lug it around and, or digitally, you know. Oh. I'm down to my loincloth and my <laughs> course digital. <laughs> you know, no, you don't even have to do this. Once you make contact with the teacher, then in that sense, the course within that dualistic framework, the words have served their purpose. It was only to make contact with the direct teacher. So, the, but there are aspects of it that, like I would say, the Holy Spirit uh, guidance. There's uh, even the the construct of right mind and wrong mind, you know, there may be like non-dual teachers that go, ha ha, that's the gotcha, <laughs> right mind, wrong mind. But there's got to be a purpose for Jesus Christ, the one, the way shower who has transcended all duality mm -hmm. to put that because he's saying, don't get caught into the dualities of the projected world, focus on You've got two purposes in your split mind, and you need to learn to forgive or release one and totally join with the other, because one's the Holy Spirit and one's the ego. You see how how that's a construct that a lot of dualistic or non-dual perspectives may say, there's no right mind and wrong mind. All is love, all is one. Even if you look at the word atonement, that we know that means a correct, correction. So if you read atonement and you read the first part, it says a t o n e atone atone is to correct atonement if you shift it around you just read a t o n e <laughs> m e n t at one meant so the atonement the correction leads to the at one meant you could just look at it different ways but but that's where the course is so helpful it's like don't try to skip you know where you can talk a good talk, you can talk a good non-dualistic talk, and then once, you, once you're not talking anymore, you have to have that experience, that direct experience. It's all in the direct experience. It's not about being a teacher as a person, because there's only one of us, but it's about having that direct contact, that direct experience. That's what it's all about. Wow. Makes it real simple. <laughs> it does. And that's why I've, I've always loved the course, because you have those two sides. Okay, this is wrong-minded, this is right-minded. Well, that's great. It's another pointer in the right direction, because I still believe in wrong-mindedness. I still believe in wrongness. So I've got to correct. 
was just sitting there saying, okay, I'm all love and I don't feel it. What do I do now? And for me, that's why the, the forgiveness is so helpful, even though, as it says, looks, waits and judges not, that it's actually doing nothing. But it's almost like I've got to have something to do to help me, yeah. <laughs> help me, help me release. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I love how the, that, the practicality of, of it in the lessons that, oh, I'm actually doing something. I remember you, you shared that. Oh, I've got this course and now I'm doing this. This is great. I'm going to learn something. And then you realize, oh, I'm actually unlearning. Yeah. I'm not here to learn something. I'm here yeah. to unlearn the whole yeah. thing of what I believed. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, I think we can start to get into to that point of, first you want to have curiosity, then you want to, curiosity involves asking questions. Mm. And then the next question could be, you could reach a point of asking questions and you could have the question, are there more valuable questions and less valuable questions? <laughs> because the ego asks the first question, what am I? And then every question of all time and space is the ego just spinning its wheels because Christ doesn't have any questions. Mm. Christ is one with mm. God. There are no questions there. But, but metaphorically, as you're rising up, you know, the Course says, Jesus says, I'm here to correct perception from the bottom up. That could be another problem with what is called non-dual teachings is, is all is God, all is one, all is love, and then try a top-down correction where, you know, you, you watch a three-hour interview and all is God, all is one for three hours. <laughs> It's all one, 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 one. Are we about done yet? Cut. Okay. I got to get a drink, you know. It's, it's too much oneness being spoken right here. What, and what the thing is, is then you have, okay, we'll open up after three hours of all is one. Let's open up some questions. I've got cancer. Would you guys uh, tell me <laughs> how can I approach that oneness? Okay, next caller, you know, there, there can be a, a little bit of a data shuffle where all is God and all is one. And then what about the practicalities of the human experience? What we're saying is that the correction, as Jesus taught, was from the bottom up. You know, he came here to, he listened to people, he talked to people, he met people on the road, he seemed to heal the sick, which was really just a reflection of divine principle, when the symptoms would disappear, walk on water, do all these things, roll away the stone, resurrect, rise people, raise people from the dead, and, and people will go, it's pretty extraordinary. You know, do you think any of that stuff happened? I said, well, in reality, nothing ever happened. So <laughs> none of it really happened. But those things in, in the context of time and space were witnesses of this amazing presence of healing the sick, raising the dead. You know, when we talk about the greats, you know, I know you know our non-duality Facebook page, and then and, and there's Yogananda, we put Ramana Maharshi, Nizagadatta, and so on and so forth, but none of those raise the dead. If you went to him and said, Yogananda, how many, how many did you raise from the dead, and, and how many um, did you heal and everything, or even with Ramana, you know, he, he sat. He was a good sitter. He was amazing <laughs> at sitting and radiating divine love and everything. And Nizar Gadada, you know, it's fine. He's a, a cigarette salesman. <laughs> it's just smoking away. And everything. all of a sudden, boom, it's all these beautiful words started coming out of this cigarette salesman, you know, and everyone, everyone's like, what the hell? <laughs> What's going on here? They love it. But they didn't heal the sick and raise the dead. That's why I think people should at least take note of of the metaphysics that this is this is Jesus, not the historical Jesus, but this is the Christ presence, mm. and this Christ presence is a very direct shot back to that love and oneness. Mm. Not the man, the, the Christ is neither, neither male nor female, mm. but this presence, the one that we call upon, the one that we join with, is is the Spirit, mm. and, and one with God. It's like a way shower in that way, and I think that's helpful that, that he's using aspects like mind training, he's using aspects like the metaphor of right mind, wrong mind, Holy Spirit, guidance. Those are all for a reason, from the way shower. Not necessarily to be dismissed, and neither am I saying that the Course is the only pathway, because if you have a desire for truth, if you have 
a, a strong calling and you have a curiosity, that, that's going to take you all the way. You could, you could wake up from just looking at a grain of sand if you have <laughs> the desire of truth. You know, that sand will disappear and so will those eyeballs and everything. So it's not, it's not exclusive in any way, but it's like if you could use something that was given to you as a way of saving time. That's our experience. It's like, whoa, this is like a complete, almost like a composite. That's my feeling was when I first came across the course was, that, oh, I've got no excuses now. I used to always like to go around and I was happy turning over every stone. All right, it's taken me a long time, but I was still, but no, ooh, I've got no excuses now because now it's been, but it's such a direct pathway. I can't complain anymore. <laughs> oh, you should have made it easier. Ooh, I did. <laughs> you should have made it more direct. Oh, yeah. I did. <laughs> I have. I done. It's done. Oh, I wanted to hear your voice. Yeah, read the book and practice it and do what I told you, and then you'll be there. But there's no wiggle room. Yeah. And, and who really wants wiggle room? You know, exactly. eternity is calling. I don't want wiggle room yeah. for time and space. So I think this is kind of important too because. This is amazing, whereas even with the, the different non-dual traditions, there can, you can kind of get stuck in rituals or saying things. You know, I like to talk about the, like Ramana Maharshi and, and that tradition. It's amazing. Self-inquiry is amazing. It's absolutely amazing pathway to God. It's, it's oftentimes for the participants and the practitioners extremely difficult. Imagine going through an entire day, 24 hours, who is the I? With, I mean, really, using your, like it's a sharp knife, but you have to use it. You can't just have your sharp knife and then put it in the holster and eat, drink, and be merry, and then at nighttime I'm going to bed. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, who is the I that did all those things? You have to, moment by moment, who is the I, who is the I? It's, it's, it takes a lot of focus. But it was great. Ramana, he just went from cave to cave and temple. And he just, he was so still, he wasn't paying any attention to the body. He could use that knife a lot. For most people, you know, obviously the mind that believes this in this world, they have so much busyness. Here's your, here's your self-inquiry knife. And then you've got a career, children, debt. And and you read the newspaper, okay, you're reading about all these events and you've got all this major complexity and busyness going and you're, you've got your self-inquiry, who is the I? But that is in the holster. You're not using it. And that makes it, that makes it uh, less effective. If you, if you use it, it's a fast track. Mm. But if you have great difficulty using the who is the I, mm. You know, who am I? That, that, that kind of a knife for peeling the onion and coming down to the core of the I amness. If you don't use it, there's trouble. And the same thing with the course. Uh, you know, the course was channeled from 1965 to 1972, came out about 1975, 76. And then, so it's been around for quite a few years, decades actually. But studying the course just ritualistically studying it and going around and around and bantering what do you think jesus meant by this and this and then they read the next paragraph and you know it the the temptations to intellectualize the course the temptations to compartmentalize the course the temptations to firmly believe you are a person who is working with a book and just staying at that level without going into those joyful experiences without giving yourself over to the miracle to be used by the by Jesus in the miracle without having these massive expansive experiences it's it's almost like uh, uh, that trying to scoop out the ocean with uh, like a little teaspoon it takes you know it seems to be very slow and time consuming and tedious mm -hmm. because the faith isn't really there for the holy instant it's almost like you're not even near that trampoline that could that could spring you back into heaven. You're more just slowly going along the roadway, still moving towards the trampoline, but that springboard is is not really. You don't fully believe that 
that in this so-called lifetime or in this human experience that you actually can reach this holy grail or this mm. springboard. And you see how then the mind decides that it will take forever or it's, it will take a long time to self-realize or to discover the truth. Mm. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If that's what you believe and that's what you believe in terms of your desire, there's so many desires for things of the world that, oh yeah, I might get around to self-realization. You know the Indian system, well, I've got to go through this. And this. I'm, a, I'm a householder now. But then you have this long householder phase of getting a house, raising the children, and, and self-realization is pushed way off. You've got to go through decades of being a householder. That's what the mind desires. It wants those things. It wants to be a householder. And then eventually you see how it pushes off self-realization. But this has to be something that's like burning in your heart mm. so that everything else, it burns the dross away, it clears everything out, and then you give yourself over to the fire. And that fire takes you and consumes everything that seemed to be there that wasn't really there. Yeah, I think that's why I came, I came to community because I could see that I'm easily distracted in the world. There's too much going on. And so I was like, okay, I need to be somewhere where I haven't got those distractions because this is what I want. And I can see that this is not what I want. So I need to really, really focus on that. Um, and as you said, with who is the I that's saying this, and even with the course, you've got to practice it. Mm -hmm. um, you have to do it because if you're not doing it, you're not going to get it anywhere. It's not just in the morning and in the evening. It's throughout the whole day. And you know, at the end of uh, most of the lessons, he always says, now practice this each time you're meeting someone yes. and if something's coming up. So it's like getting it in there all of the time. And that's what I that's what I love. Um, yeah, there was one question um, I've wanted to ask you this for a long, long time, um, and I absolutely loved it when I first heard it. It really helped me, and it was um, from Absence of Felicity. And in there, um, Helen asked Jesus, "So did you truly resurrect?" And he's like, "Yeah, I completely resurrected. I completely and utterly let go of everything, and that's why I'm." Um, head of the sonship basically mm -hmm. and I was like wow I was blown away but I was kind of interested that people don't don't talk about that but for me that was like oh wow this is this is truly possible so like, yeah. yeah I did that it's absolutely true but it's yeah. like not many people kind of talk about that I just wondered your 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 thoughts on that because I'm I, don't, I, I think I, I think I heard they decided not to put it in the book because they thought people wouldn't wouldn't believe it it, it was too far he said, no, yeah, I, I completely and utterly left altogether. Yeah. yeah. I think it again comes down to the, the vastness of the, of the meaning and the experience. For example, there was a, a, a great uh, curious man named Joseph Campbell. And, and Joseph uh, decided to write this book on mythology. And, and Joseph was a great historian. I mean, he was digging around through all of history and... When you really get into mythology, you can start to see that throughout cultures, throughout time and space, there have been these uh, resurrection stories. A lot of times when you talk to Christians, they will just say, uh, well, you know, Jesus resurrected and nobody else did. But Joseph Campbell actually discovered a number of resurrection stories um, throughout history in different cultures. But what you're talking about is not resurrection of the body. In other words, all these different resurrection stories have a body mm. going away or dying and coming back. Mm. And that's part of the, the mythology of Jesus. You know, mm. It's part of time and space, so it's all perception. So when people go, oh, there you go. I heard David said Jesus' resurrection was a myth. <laughs> He's not really a true Christian. The whole cosmos is mythology. Everything of time is, all perception is mythology. So, so there's nothing true or eternal about any of it, but, but those were symbols. But I would say that, that it's talked about in the Course that, that his resurrection, what we would call in body, was just the tiniest little thing in Jesus' contribution. In other words, why? Why was it so tiny? That seems pretty good uh, to come back and roll a stone. The stone was rolled away. and you know, It seemed pretty unusual to just say it was tiny. The reason it was tiny is because the resurrection of a body means nothing. You know, a dead body and a live body 
in perception is a big deal. So how's your aunt, you know, Hilda? She's dead. What about your aunt Franny? She's alive. Big difference, right? No. Dead human, alive human. Mm. They're, they're, it's a dream. Yeah. So there's one concept of a dead human and one... So that's why I love that movie, Solaris, mm. when at the very end of the movie, you know, the Chris Kelvin character says, Am I dead? Am I alive? Rhea, we don't have to think like that anymore. Here, that was Jesus's contribution. We don't have to think about dead or alive anymore because it's a big deal in time and space. Yeah. You know, it's a big deal, but it's not a big deal because a dead human or a live human, they're both illusions. Birth and death seem to be very different also on the timeline, but they're actually the same because they're just concepts. In eternity, nothing's born, nothing dies. They're just concepts. Mm -hmm. So a resurrection, a dead Jesus, crucified on the cross, a risen Jesus, whoo, yeah. whoo, big deal, big deal. Yeah. In Christianity, whoo, whoo, big deal. That's the Savior. That's, that was God incarnate. No, 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 no. That's just not a big deal. It's the resurrection of the mind. Mm -hmm. The mind that transcended the ego. Mm. Be of good cheer, it, he said, for I have overcome the world. He was saying, be of good cheer, I have overcome the ego. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the, it was the spirit, the eternal spirit speaking. No one comes to the Father but through me. The Father is just a, a word, you know, God, oneness, call it what you want. This, that was the, the pathway was clear. But there was the resurrection of the mind. So this is a mind bender for Christians, but I, I always say the Jesus resurrected before he went on his public mission. They're like, oh, you got the story way wrong. No, he was born of a virgin. Not really, but that makes for a nice story. That was a nice little add-on. But okay, he was... He was born of a virgin. He grew up at, at 12. Don't you know I must be about my father's business? He tells off his parents. They did not like that, even at that time. And then he goes on, and then let's say he's in his early 30s. He starts calling apostles, follow me, follow me, follow me. And then there's right before that, um, there was the, the River Jordan, John being baptized by John the Baptist, and then the the dove that comes down, the voice in the skies, mm -hmm. this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then you go and you call the apostles and Mary Magdalene, you've got the women, you know, we got, and then you go through this whole teaching ministry of a few years. And then, you know, the garden of Gethsemane and all this and this, and then Pontius Pilate and the whole story. See, what do you mean? Jesus was re resurrected before before he went on his public mission. Now that came, that came at the end of it. That's what ended his public mission <laughs> was the crucifixion. And then the resurrection came after the crucifixion. From a timeline, it looks that way. But when Jesus really recognized that the Christ was real, the I am presence, before Abraham was, I am, resurrected beyond the timeline, which was an illusion, and realized the I am presence is all that there really is, and spoke those words, I and the Father are one, that roll that back. That is the Christ. That is a resurrected mind. It has nothing to do with the body. See how deep this goes, that, that the body has nothing to do with crucifixion or resurrection. And then when you read his course, he will often use the word crucifixion of God's Son as just whenever you're upset, whenever you're have a grievance whenever you're unhappy. He's describing the crucifixion of God's son as the unholy instant, as a state of mind that's hell, that's sin, that's error. You know, it's not happy. That is the crucifixion of God's son, is that instant, which seems to be a timeline. The timeline is hell. And the timeline is that state of mind, of perception, that is very hellish. It's got positives and negatives, but there's no consistency, no eternity. It's very unnatural compared to the heaven and the Christ. So, and the resurrection is waking up from the timeline and, and experiencing yourself as an eternal being and then sharing that. 
you know, that is the resurrection. So that's why a lot of people don't talk about it is, is people don't even have a concept. You have to go through a lot of mind training and a lot of opening just to start to come to what I just shared. And, and for the masses, they would say, well, that's just gobbledygook. That's, his body came out of a, of a sepulcher. <laughs> I like that word. It, his body comes out of the cave and they would say that that was a resurrection. It mm. came back to life. Mm. And the body doesn't have life. The, the body never had life. How can you come back to life if you've never been, you've never lived in a body? You see, it's fiction. Mm. It's an image. And images don't have life. You know, hold no grave in images in front of the Lord thy God. Hold no idols in front of God. Hold no images of time and space before the Lord thy God. That's actually what what the teaching was about. And Jesus resurrected and went, oh my gosh, the Lord thy God is, is the giver of life. Eternal life is what life is. And there is no such thing as biological life. Think what that does to vegetarianism, you know. Think all the constructs that people argue about and debate seemingly. It's the ego debating with itself. You know, you can't kill animals, you can't do this, you can't do that. Well, if you're belief is that there's really life in this world, then that's going to just be, that's political too. Everything of perception is political. Resurrection is staying vertical, staying, you know, above the battleground, staying fully right-minded, and that is the gateway to eternal life. It makes it so simple, you know, it's like there are no mysteries anymore. You know, everyone talks about the mystery of God and the mystery of life, but God wants everything to be openly revealed. God wants you to be able to smile and laugh and be in joy and, and be in recognition of this state of mind, not walking around saying it's a mystery. That's just another game. You can put on a priest garb and go, oh, it's a divine mystery and come to confessional. Will you pray for me? Yes. You know, they, they make movies where the priest is in there doing crossword puzzle. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. You know, they make some funny scenes because it's the human thing is like it's so different from that honest connection of of humbleness. You know, I, I am humbly a creation of God. <laughs> that that is what it's all really about. <laughs> I think we've covered everything. Yeah, I think we did. <laughs> I think we've done the whole thing. I think we did. We just <laughs> zoom, discovered the whole thing. Wow. Thank yeah. you so much for that. Thank you. What a joy. <laughs> yeah, it was so what wonderful. A joy. Yeah. Yeah, really beautiful to hear that sharing. <laughs> yes. So thank you everyone for joining us. Have you enjoyed that? And maybe we'll do another one. We shall see. <laughs>